Welcome everybody and thank you very much for coming along. Uh, I'm excited to introduce Danny who's going to uh, talk about travel photography and landscape photography and how to capture the essence of your journey and with reference to his recent journey. Um, this is very uh, on topic for us this semester since we're having a whole semester in the galleries devoted to the idea of landscape um, through various lenses. And we're really happy to have Danny here to contribute to that program. Thank you. Well, I must say that it's remarkable. I don't know if this is an art department um, usual precedent, but it seems like this is one of the first times I remember that the front of the theater filled up before the back of the theater. So you must be dedicated students, and that's awesome to hear. Uh, my name is Danny Ladoni. Um, I actually grew up here in Alamosa, but like many people here from the Valley, I developed a curiosity for other parts of the world, and I wanted to see with my own eyes what it was that was out there, but also wanted to find ways to share that experience and bring it back for other people who might not have been able to go. So um, what I did this last summer was go on a field study with Dr. Tim Armstrong, who's a professor here in the biology department. And he has gone on many of these expeditions. He really tries to focus on biology uh, as his area of interest, wildlife. And so I've gone with him to Kenya and also to uh, Australia. Um, I've also been to the Galapagos Islands and Alaska, places like that. But I actually have a background in filmmaking and only recently got into photography. So um, I, I will say that this, is a, this represents about my third year of taking seriously the proposition of composing images. So what I'm going to do actually is show you the, the, the magic trick first and then I will show you some of the magic. And I'm hoping that those of you who are interested in photography will appreciate uh, being able to see what goes into an image. And then I'll just show you some of those images as we go. So uh, this is Machu Picchu in Peru. And I will talk in a minute about exactly where we went. So I'm going to step out from behind the podium. Um, and so this, of course, is one of the famous and final dwellings of the Incan civilization up until about the 1600s when they encountered the uh, Spanish explorers and others. This area was actually lost for a time and then recently uh, returned to awareness for Western civilization uh, as we know it today. Um, that's about as close, as, uh, close for comfort as I would get to the edge, by the way. There are people who injure or kill themselves every year doing dangerous things. So a uh, word of caution, even if you're trying to fixate on that perfect frame and you're trying to get that great image, you must really be conscious of the world around you because it doesn't stop simply because you're trying to get that great image. So even if, if the uh, shots of the lion or the bear charging at you were amazing, you want to be able to live to tell the tale as well. So that's a separate consideration. Uh, so this is what we actually did. Um, this is Peru in South America. Uh, and we flew into the capital of um, Lima right there. And then we flew from there to Cusco. And we spent our time in this area here in kind of the southeastern part of the continent. But um, I think, as you'll see from the photos, there's an amazing variety of landscapes in that area. So I was really pleased by how much we were able to accomplish. Um, within that map, you can kind of see in this direction down here is where Cusco is. Uh, we actually went up into the jungle of Manu National Park. And so some of the images you'll see today focus on this journey we took uh, by car and then by boat and then uh, also back by car so that we took kind of a big loop and got to see a lot of this jungle area from the highlands, about 14, 15,000 feet, uh, down into the jungle where uh, I went tromping with my boots. I, because I have short feet, the water in the river went up under the boots, and I got my socks wet, and they did not dry for three days. So imagine how different it is than the valley, right, where things seem to dry up in five minutes or less uh, to be in an environment like that. So this is what I saw when I got back home. It's not that inspiring, I know. 
But this is the first step when you return from any kind of uh, field study. Uh, if you have excellent eyes, you can see in the bottom this says 1,240 items. So that's the number of images that I took over the course of that time. And I consider myself to be something of a uh, selective photographer. I'm not that guy who's like taking eight or ten of everything. I really try to stop and think about what I want this image to be. But at the same time, I know it's really easy to delete them later. So, and card space is cheap, right? So if you have the choice to shoot or not to shoot, you should shoot. Uh, so from this over thousand pictures, and by the way, most of these are in ARW format. That's a raw image format, and I'll talk in a minute about why raw image format is something if you haven't done yet, you really want to do. So if there's one takeaway lesson, write it down on the top of your notes. Danny says shoot in raw. And for those of you who are like, what is that, like vegetables? No, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is Adobe Lightroom. Lightroom is a software program that allows you to really um, uh, adjust the image in the same way that you would use a dark room for actual film photography. So think of this as like a digital dark room. Uh, show of hands here, who has used a program like Lightroom before to actually go in and manipulate photographs? All right, so over half of you. The good news is even your iPhone or Android, uh, Instagram, there are all kinds of very uh, inexpensive free applications to do many of the things I'm describing today. So don't feel like walking out of this lecture, oh, I, I can't you know, pony up the money to buy Lightroom. I'm just not going to do digital photography. Um, don't let that stop you, because there are definitely tools to do so. So as you can see, I've made a little bit of progress. If I can find the number. Uh, yeah, so at the bottom here, I've now gone from 1,240 to 337 photos. So I'm making progress, right? Because I went out of my overall set of everything I shot down to about a quarter of that um, to, to pick images that really were unique to me. So think about that whenever you are taking photographs and then importing them. You want to think about each image adding something new to the set. And that is true for landscapes. I've done real estate and archival museum photography. Uh, I've done weddings. So no matter what you're shooting, think about what does this image have to say that no other image does. And if you shot three or four of the same thing, pick your favorite. And sometimes that's like picking your favorite child, right? Because there might be different reasons why you like each of them. But think about if you only had to pick one, what that is. And um, you know, as well as with film editing, sometimes you have to be a little bit tough on yourself. And if you find that you can't do that, get a second opinion. Invite a friend over. Look over all your photos together. And I guarantee, even if your friend doesn't say a word, the fact that someone is with you as you go through the photos will force you to see them in a different way. It's a really interesting phenomenon. So I've now gone to a quarter of the images I have, and you see them all kind of laid out as I go through my import settings in my library. And now I'm going to develop them. In this, you can see the different tools that are available to you to adjust a photograph. We'll talk a little bit more about each of them. So I'm on the third photo in this whole series. And over here on the right side are a lot of the tools that I can use to adjust areas of what's called the response curve. Uh, if you use a histogram, you can see what that response curve is. What does that mean? That means the difference between absolute black and absolute white. That is the range that any kind of camera can pick up and say, OK, this is a photo. Our eyes are the same way, right? If you're in a dark room like this and you walk out into the bright sunlight, it's going to take your eyes a minute to readjust because none of us have the optics such that we can see the entire spectrum of light all the time at once, right? So we're always kind of tuning our own eyes, and we tune our camera's eyes in the same way. So by shooting in raw, what you actually are doing is giving your camera more information than you could ever use in one photo. It's the same in film. One of the problems with early digital photography is that it only captured a very narrow electronic signal, and then everything else was lost forever. Whereas with film, you could, uh, you could print it a little darker, a little lighter, put it in the exposure bath longer um, to bring out certain things in your photography, particularly in black and white. 
uh, what RAW does is behave a little bit more like film. You get a digital photograph that you can actually pull more into your dark areas. You can get some of your highlights and get detail from them. And so I'll show you in some subsequent examples what that looks like. The first thing I start to do is to crop my image. Now, in the previous image, it was already cropped, so you didn't notice I cropped it. But take a look at this image. You see all that area to the left and also on the top. That was the original photo as I shot it. And then I get into the uh, development phase, and I look at that, and I say, you know, that top area, that doesn't add a lot to it. One thing to keep in mind is, what is my aspect ratio supposed to be? Are my final images supposed to be widescreen? Or are they supposed to be square? Are these supposed to fit a series where they're all the same dimension? Or can I make each image call for what that image wants, which is what I've done here. I've said, I don't care what the final size is. I just want the image to look the way that I want. So I've gone in and I've cropped that image to really kind of focus in on where I think the detail is and throw away the information that's not very interesting. Now you can see a side-by-side -side comparison before and after I apply some filters to the image. Now, I will say that this is a good video projector, but it's kind of not perfect. So uh, I do think, though, that you can notice some difference here in the detail. Look particularly at where the clouds are at. See how there's much more blue in the sky here, and you can make out where those clouds are. Look at the actual saturation of the color before and after. We get more detail in some of these gold and orange areas. We get more uh, detail in some of the brighter spots as well. So those are some of the goals that I have when I start developing a photo, to really bring out what that photo has to say. Um, you can save presets. So once you have an image the way you like, you can save that set of changes and then apply them to other images in your series. So if you're in a hurry, you pick one you like, you do that, and then you apply it to everything. But the problem with that is, Maybe each image is a little bit different and has unique needs. And what worked for the last image won't work for this one. So there's not really a, a kind of a, a quick way out if you want to get great images. Um, and it bears mentioning that this is the resolution that I'm editing at, but this is the actual size of the photograph. So whenever I'm editing, I'm only seeing like an eighth, a sixteenth of the overall image because it's shooting at like 20 megapixels, which is what happens when you multiply the width by the length of the image, you get what's called the megapixel count, which is how many little dots your camera records at any given time. And so now I'm seeing the image as it actually uh, is um, in a one-to-one -one basis. So if you want to zoom in and really look at detail, you know, what is this change doing to this part of the image? You can go in and do that. Uh, this is another example where I've cropped out an area that I didn't think was as interesting up in the top and over to the left to kind of focus in on what I thought was interesting about. Uh, this is um, one of the many places they sell merchandise around uh, the city of Cusco. Here's another example where I tried to bring out some of the color that was uh, there. This is downtown Cusco. Um, and what's notable about this is we have a really strong Z axis. Um, anyone want to give me a quick definition of what the Z axis is? What did I even just say? So for those of you who took algebra, um, the x and the y axis are uh, up and down and side to side, right? The z axis measures forward to backward. So an image that has a strong z axis is one that has a lot of perspective. And you can see those columns as they approach, uh, moving from the left to the right, really highlight that perspective. This is also an example of an image that has kind of a frame within a frame, that you see the pillars create a structure around that image. So um, I really like that one almost the way it was, and I just punched up the color there. This is a similar example for this landscape, just trying to bring out more of the, uh, more of the detail. It's kind of the middle of winter in Peru at that point. Uh, we went in July, so that's their winter. Uh, and then a similar effect on this image, just trying to bring out the greens, trying to bring out uh, some of the great contrast early in the morning there. And then this is an example of something that I almost didn't photograph at all. I'm literally walking around uh, on the path in the jungle, and right in front of me is this tiny um, caterpillar. And so uh, it's hanging down by a thread, and I, as best I can, get it in focus, take a photo, 
And um, I don't actually have the right equipment to do great macro photography, which is photographing uh, really small things close up. Um, but I did the best I could. And then I tried to bring out more detail so that you can see the individual segments um, of that caterpillar. So this is an example of uh, a monkey. That you'll see the photo later in the set that I cropped to really just focus on the subject matter. So the good news is uh, you can only zoom so much right, with the optics of your lens. Um, if you're using something like an iPhone, um, although the new iPhone actually does this a little bit differently, um, you have a, a fixed length for your zoom. You can only get the image that you have because it's only one set of elements for the glass. But when you have those zoom lenses, what it's actually doing is taking the image from when it strikes that first element of the lens and magnifying as it goes back through the lens. So when you see those photographers at sporting events or in the wild have those really long lenses, what that means is that they're able to magnify an object very far away, very close up uh, when it's being photographed. So you do the best with your optical zoom. Um, but then what you can do if you're shooting at a high enough resolution is do some digital zoom where you know most of that image I'm not as interested in. So I really heavily crop the image um, until I got something that I like. Now, when you crop it this much, if you were to get a poster size image of this, what you would end up with is pretty blurry because you never get that resolution back that you photographed originally. But for uploading this to Facebook, you'd never know the difference because the size of the original resolution was way higher than anything that um, you would see while you're flipping through your phone or uh, using one of those applications. So uh, part of what this consideration is, is what am I going to do with the images? You know, If they're going to be printed up as posters, you have different sets of options and considerations than if you're uploading photos to a website or something like that. Uh, same thing with this Mott Mott. This was a much larger picture and I cropped it. Um, we'll get to that later. Uh, so this is an example of where shooting in RAW can really help you out. Um, because when you have, for example, uh, people in baseball caps, um, exactly what the baseball cap is supposed to do, keep the sun out of their eyes, really makes it difficult for you to see them when you take a photograph. So um, being able to underexpose a little bit and then push up those midtones to really see more detail um, in someone's face, even though they might have uh, a cap on or maybe they're in the shadow side and the sun is behind them. So the goal sometimes is to try and even out the image to get everything in a range that's easier to see and easier to get that detail in. Um, this is just an example of trying to bring more color to the evening uh, sunset. So if you want to you know, add a little bit more of the warm color palette to it, you can do that. And this also has a lot to do with what you set your camera to when you are doing what's called white balance. So every room, every space has a different color temperature, which is measured in Kelvin. And it's measured that way because at different temperatures, light has a different color all the way up to uh, sort of the, the brightest, purest uh, white. But uh, evening sunsets tend to be a little more gold. Now, whether your camera reads that as being gold depends on what you set your camera's white balance to. So I might have my white balance set from the middle of the day, taking lots of photos, and then the sun starts to set. And if I don't remember to change it or rebalance it or adjust it, I'm going to end up with images that might be a little more blue than I would want. So this is a way to kind of bring back those evening color palettes. Now, at some point, you might have already thought, isn't Danny cheating? Uh, and that really is, I think, anyone's call. I would say that in the world of ethics of photography, doing these kinds of adjustments, most people see as acceptable. Because it's, like, it's not like I photoshopped a second sun in like we're on Tatooine in Star Wars, right? Like this is still basically the sunset that we all saw. I just kind of brought out the colors. I kind of interpreted it a little bit. But we'll get to a different example where I broke a few more rules in a minute. Uh, so in addition to cropping this picture, did anyone el does anyone notice what else I did to this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so imagine uh, we're up at, uh, this is the, the top of the pass. Uh, we've gone from the jungle, now we're in the highlands, um, and it's actually quite cool up there. We're still all dressed for the jungle, so we're pretty cold. Um, and then here, is, uh, here are these... Um, 
different animals grazing on the side, and I said, oh boy, I want to get out and film some. So I jumped down, and I'm on the side of the hill. I'm leaning like this. I'm taking a photo like this. It's really hard to get a sense for what's level when you're on the side of a mountain. So for images like this, I then will kind of adjust them to, to rotate them so they're up and down again. Now, that doesn't mean all images have to be that way. Like this alpaca, maybe I wanted it to have a certain curve because I want to express something about the shape of the landscape. So don't feel like you have to make every image up and down just because you can. Um, and here's just an example of trying to bring out more of the detail and more of the colors. Um, this is one of the townspeople in Cusco. Uh, they enjoy getting their photograph taken if you pay them. So uh, I coughed up some money and she, uh, f let me, she posed for me with her, uh, with her little goat. Similar example here, just trying to bring out the, the colors. This is the middle of their winter, so the grass isn't as green as it might be, but I did want to play up those colors a little bit there. And then this is another example of rotating a photo slightly um, because I feel like if you're going to have a photo that is at an angle, it needs to be definitely at an angle. It needs to look intentional. You don't want an image that just slightly is off in a way that people think, did they mean to do that? And you're not sure. So make sure that if you're going to make a choice, um, especially it's a little bit out of the ordinary, that you're really doing so intentionally. And then this is the last before and after that I'll show you. Uh, this is another good example of why shooting raw can really help bring out some of the details. So, um, you know, the top of the church there would have been all but lost entirely, um, especially on, on your screen. I can see a little more detail here, but um, in order to really even out that image, to get more detail in the clouds, to be able to get the, uh, the, the church there, um, with the steeple in the distance and get that also it looks pleasing to the eye it takes a little bit of work and so shooting in raw gives you the latitude to do that so now I'll just go through some photos and then um, if you have any questions as we go about how did we get that or um, just anything like that please raise your hand or just let me know um, and so the first day or two we were there, I was basically doing street photography. And that's kind of its own set of landscapes in and of itself. You want to capture what's going on, what you're seeing around you, um, and trying to convey that in a way that other people might understand. So that means being able to get things at kind of your eye level, but that also means really trying to get detail, really trying to look in closely at what you're seeing. Um, I tend to like these close-ups because it really gives a nice um, out of focus to the background, what's uh, called depth of field. Uh, the, the more you zoom in or the longer the lens of your camera, the less that's in focus at any given time, uh, which can present challenges because in, in a situation like this, it's easier to mess up the focus. Right? When you're zoomed all the way out, especially on a bright sunny day, your aperture, your iris, is stopped way, way down. And so the more your iris is closed down and the wider your lens is, the more is going to be in focus. But if you're in a darker area, like this is um, this, is this indoor area, um, not as much light, and then I'm zooming in, that means less and less and less is in focus. So it's very important to pay attention when you're shooting this way to make sure what you want is in focus. And frankly, the autofocus on a lot of cameras can be easily tricked because it doesn't necessarily know what you want to see. It might very easily think I was interested in some object around this object or something like that. So you may want to take a minute to really get what you want in focus. And there are a few tools. Uh, for example, one is called peaking, where you can turn on, a lot of cameras have, and that basically puts a red outline around whatever is in focus. It doesn't record that way, but it displays that. And so peaking would be one way to see what am I actually getting in focus in this image. Uh, another way is to zoom all the way in, set your focus on what you want, and then zoom out. And then you know you've nailed it to exactly the point that you want it to be at. Uh, so these are some of our travel companions. Um, so I will say in general when shooting human subjects, and this is a little bit less challenging than it used to be because more and more of us have cameras. They're so ubiquitous, especially if you're using like a smartphone. Um, everyone has them. So you kind of want to wait until no one notices you, right? Because when you first pull out a camera, 
I don't know, I feel like there are two kinds of people. There are the people that when you bring out a camera, they run up to you like, oh, what are you doing? Hey, can I be a part of it? And then there are other people like, oh my God, I'm gonna get out of here. And they don't want to be you know, photographed. So um, what you ultimately want to do is just have your camera out all the time. Just kind of normalize the idea that you'll have it. And so, you know, sometimes I, I turn off all the, the noises, all the lights. I don't want anything to draw attention to myself. I actually generally kind of, I'll make eye contact once in a while and smile and nod, but I tend to try and not draw attention to myself so I can get better photos of whatever people are doing. So you saw this image earlier. This was one of several. Uh, and again, so out of the 1,200 photos, maybe about 10 of them were similar to this one. I just picked the one that I really liked. Um, and so you'll kind of have to look through your set and say, okay, which really got to the point? And it tends, honestly, not to be the first image. It tends to be, for me, if I'm in a hurry, I'll just look at the last image in a series that I shot and use that one. Because if it was good enough that I moved on after that, I must have kind of got what I wanted. Whereas generally the first image or two that I get, even if at the time I feel good about it, it's still kind of a rough draft. And you want to keep working with the space and trying different angles and seeing what really works for you. Um, there are ver variations of this image where there are no uh, pillars. It's just the church, right, as you saw it. And that's a fine photograph. But I feel like it really adds something uh, to the viewer's eye to be able to incorporate more layers. So this is kind of a close-up of just one part of the church. Um, and right below the horizon line are lots of lots of people that were there that day. But what I wanted was I just wanted to focus on the structure. So sometimes your framing involves cropping out things that you don't want to see. Figuring out what do I want to focus on, what do I not want to focus on. So the streets in Cusco, it was a very uh, hilly city. So you kind of see one of the, the steep climbs up and down the, the streets of the city. And I just wanted an image that really focused on those vanishing points. Uh, one of the traffic police, um, there aren't a lot of uh, stoplights. I think maybe I saw any. So uh, they, they had uh, police directing traffic. Uh, and as you can see, depending on how fast someone is moving and what you set your shutter speed to. And the shutter speed measures how long your camera is exposed to light for the one image that it takes, because we all think it happens quickly. But how quickly depends on what you set your shutter speed to. So if someone is quickly gesturing and you photograph that, you're going to see that there. Now, is that right or is that wrong? Eh, kind of depends on what you want. Um, in this case, it suggests motion. So even though it's a still image, we feel like it's moving because we see that mo motion blur in her, um, in her hand. Uh, maybe if I wanted to, I could have set the shutter speed higher for a, a smaller fraction of a second, and I would have gotten that as one image. Um, so it depends on the kind of photography you're doing. For example, if you're doing sports photography, um, I filmed a bunch of baseball players, and we wanted to technically analyze their swing as they followed through and then struck the ball. And so in order to do that well, you really have to have a high shutter speed, which means it needs to be really bright outside because it needs uh, to use all that light in very little time to get a good image. So your shutter speed is sometimes just another example of if you don't have a lot of light, that's an area where if it's a, a stationary subject, like you want to photograph the stars at night, um, you can set your shutter speed to a really, really small number where you're taking many seconds of exposure to get one image. And as long as the image is fairly static, then you'll see that. But any motion will start to blur um, in that way. So this is an example of like most of the frame not being the thing that you're, you're thinking to see. But I really wanted to focus on the, the just interesting texture of these rocks that they use throughout the city to build a lot of these walls. So I wanted to emphasize that as part of the image there. Uh, so this is one of the uh, street merchants selling artwork. And this is a, a very famous um, theme of painting there, the, uh, the gossiping women. And so it would have been one thing to photograph the, uh, just the photograph, but I wanted to show 
the kinds of people that you meet. Uh, they all give themselves kind of Americanized names when they greet you. And this guy actually remembered me four or five days later when we came back to Cusco. So he, um, I actually bought something from him later because I thought he was a pretty awesome guy. Uh, but this is another photograph that I'm intentionally uh, somewhat at an angle, right? Not straight up and down. Because basically he's holding his photo at an angle. And so I wanted to kind of split the difference between where he's at and where the, the photo is at there. So um, this is an example of something I wanted to get kind of an interesting close up of. Uh, and so I pushed myself kind of right up against this old VW bug. This is Inca Cola. That's also one of my attempts at taking a selfie, uh, as I've done a, a few here. Um, there's been a lot written and a lot said about selfies and how they say something about you know, the narcissistic culture we live in. But I think selfies actually have a different kind of value to them, which is that you know, anyone can go on Google Image and get basically all the photos that I took today in some way, shape, or form. Maybe they're not exactly like mine, but you know, we can get a sense for that. But when you take a selfie, I think people are trying to say, I was here. It's not just that I got a photo of it, but I can prove to you that I'm the person that was there at the time that it was taken. So the one thing I will say about selfies is uh, if you're working with an aspect ratio that permits it, try to get other things in the frame than just yourself. Think about getting yourself on one side of the frame. You know, we talk about the rule of thirds where you have the, the basically your image divided into nine sections and you want things kind of on the edges but not in the center. So in the very center of the image is the background and I wanted this to be me and my Inca Cola, which are all over a lot of um, a lot of Peru anyway. It's basically like I would call it like a banana cream soda is what it tastes like. Um, so uh, this is a close up of a much larger photo that I took, but I wanted to get um, the uh, the alpaca looking down at all of us. Uh, sometimes with landscapes, I think about kind of stacking your horizon. So you have the 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 nearest plane, which has your grass. Uh, and then you have this kind of midground, which is this just really interesting rock formation, likely due to, uh, due to wind and possibly also water. You just get this erosion um, on that shape there. And then behind that, you can see the tree line. And behind that, you can see the mountains. So try to think about where you want to place your horizon, um, given that we got kind of about, I don't know, maybe like four or five, if you want to divide it into fractions, you have kind of a third, and then maybe a third, and then maybe a third. Um, of these different um, areas there. Uh, on the left hand side I have this tree which I feel like kind of balances out that side against the other side there. Um, so none of these things are accidental. I guess that's one of the bigger points I want to take away is that when you compose an image you're not just snapping a photo, right? You just like look at it, dink, and then you move on. Really think about where you want your frame and what you want it to say. Um, on a good day, it feels a little bit more like painting or something like that, where you're really controlling what you want your composition to do. And it isn't merely, um, you know, like this is close up, this is framed a certain way. I wanted to get a certain kind of image. So I'll speed along here a little bit more, but you can kind of get the sense where I wanted to, to emphasize different elements in one photo, because this is along the Inca Trail, which is um, kind of a historic area that's been traveled um, for thousands of years. And you can kind of see one of the remnants here of this brick structure amidst these kind of rolling hillsides. Um, similar here, I wanted to show in the foreground that we have some rock structures in addition to this kind of valley that we're on the edge of. Um, a lot of bright colors. Uh, people who travel Central and South America often talk about just how, how bright the colors are. Um, and so if you can, try to, try to really emphasize that and try to really, you know, it's almost like a rainbow is laying out before you and all you have to do is, is grab it. Um, cool little dolls that I wanted to get a um, photo of close up. Um, and then this is kind of one of the winding roads as we're going into the rainforest. Um, this was taken from the middle seat of a van. <laughs> so, uh, you know, sometimes when you're in a moving vehicle, you want to figure out where you want to be. Some of these photos will be taken from um, the passenger seat looking out. And again, you want to think about, so which side of the vehicle do I want to be on, given that I'm in a country where people are driving on, you know, this or that side of the road, right? Because when in Australia, it was the opposite. Uh, do I want to get across or do I want to get just my side? Uh, and then in this case, literally right here and literally off to that side are people's heads. 
So I cropped that out to get the image that I wanted. Uh, this is where we are arriving at kind of uh, the small town right outside Machu Picchu. Uh, I just found it fascinating how uh, high up the mountains go on all sides uh, and the only way in or out is by the Peru rail so you can kind of see the trains um, in the town. And so now we're getting to Machu Picchu and you can kind of see some of the images there. Again, a lot of layers, a lot of really dramatic canyons, hills, valleys. This is another example of a frame within a frame. These are the windows in Machu Picchu where you can actually look out as uh, the Incans did. Um, and so some of the different wildlife that I encountered while I was there. As long as you're still, uh, generally they will, they're curious and they'll just want to see what you are. Uh, and if you have time, like say 10, 15 minutes and you're willing to do it, you can incrementally get closer and closer to most animals and you also kind of learn what their sort of permitted safe zone is and it really kind of depends on the actual animal itself. Um, but they all have kind of a tolerance depending on how often they see people, how close you can get, you know, um, to get different images you might want. This is a panoramic. Um, some cameras offer a panoramic feature. Um, so similarly, you want to think about, especially in these environments, how do you expose for an image like this? Where do you want your exposure to be given that there's such a range? Uh, where do you want your image to begin and end when you're taking a panorama? Arguably, this image could have ended right where that first rock edge is, uh, but I wanted to show a little bit more about how the Incans were able to structure these, uh, these rocks to essentially be self-supporting. It's pretty fascinating. Um, this is kind of the back side. Um, this is one of the examples where, you know, like most cameras, if you turn it sideways, you get a different aspect ratio. So if you want to emphasize a more vertical frame, don't always think about your, your picture as being a single set thing. Think about how you can use it to really capture an image that you then crop and that you then create a certain um, dimensions for. This is late afternoon. So when we arrived, it was cloudy. By the time we left, we had that great evening sunlight. And so in these last images you see, uh, we're getting kind of 3, 4 o'clock. It's uh, the park is shutting down. They're ushering people out. And we're getting our last photographs as we leave. Tend to, just ended up being one of my favorite images from the set. Um, you know, because the, uh, the llamas were posed just so. And um, it was just one of many, many photos I took of them. This is the one I liked the most. As you can see, kind of the, the dramatic sunlight coming in across the valley there. You can kind of see the whole thing one side to the other as people are, are leaving. And just, I mean, that mountain range is, is pretty amazing and spectacular. You'll see in a few photos, we actually climbed um, that mountain called Huena Pichu the next morning, and you'll get to see this area from a distance. Um, yeah. So this is a before and after. All right, so this is before. I want you to notice all those little specks over there. Those are all people that were leaving the park when we were. But I wanted a photo without people. So I went in Photoshop and I removed them. <laughs> and you do that using what's called the clone stamp tool. I think, uh, I think if you've never used Photoshop, you've got to learn to kind of respect. It's not as easy as it sounds. It's not magic. You still have to go in and actually do the work. And for uh, um, something like the clone stamp tool to work, essentially what it's doing is it's taking a part of the image and then replicating it somewhere else. So if you have a pattern like these rocks, I can take that pattern here and put it somewhere else where someone was standing. So as long as there's area around the area, you can do that. So if I'm standing at the bottom of a ladder, I can use, because I'm short, right? I can use the top part of the ladder and then copy it over me several times until I'm not there anymore and it's just the ladder, right? So this is how you could do something like that. I also, you know, re-angled the image a little bit. But I removed about 10 people from the previous photo to this one here. And this is the only photo I did this to, honestly, out of the whole set, but I wanted at least one photo where that was the case. So that's what I did. Another selfie, you can see actually down there, that's the canyon that we came in on. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And this is uh, that evening. So really interesting mixed light here because the sun is almost set. So you're getting that ambient light, which is sometimes called magic hour. 
Um, but we're also getting street lights and also headlights. There's a, a parade and kind of a musical event going on. This is actually, we were there during the Peruvian independence celebration. So many parades, many uh, festivities. And so we happen to be there for that. This is the next morning. This is a panorama. I love just I love the I love when clouds can kind of layer themselves amidst the mountains and you can get just real texture um, as they kind of roll over there and you can kind of see where they fit into that landscape. Uh, and then you see here all those switchbacks. That is the road that takes you to Machu Picchu. So you start down in this canyon area and you switch back over and over until you reach the visitor center, which is kind of in the trees in the center right of the frame. And then the actual ruins are to the far right of the frame. And this was taken from Buena Picchu, the peak that we hiked. Um, just another one of my favorite images. And sometimes, you know, it's not like the most dramatic image that you like the most, but I like how the mountain's kind of there in the distance, and you've got those layers of um, all of the stonework that they've done. And this area is basically looks the same as it did hundreds of years ago. Um, so it's, it's a pretty interesting experience just to be there. This was on our way uh, down into the jungle, and um, this was actually just part of a bathroom break. But uh, when I got out of the vehicle, it was like, 6.30 in the morning. We got up at like 3.30 or 4 so that we could get to where we're at now. Um, and I was just taking pictures like crazy because the light was so great. This valley just blew me away. And over to the right, you can see some pre-Incan ruins that were uh, built primarily, as I understand it, for uh, burial uh, ceremonial purposes. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. And I took a few images of those as well. Um, I think it's just interesting whenever you can kind of contrast kind of the, the modernity and you can see in the background a, a town that's there um, and then kind of the more ancient ruins um, in the foreground. And then that's the sunny side of the same thing. And then that's just a photo of the valley. Again, just lots of interesting colors and textures. Uh, there was so much to take in. I will say the one regrettable thing about travel photography is that sometimes you miss out on the experience of just being in the moment. So sometimes before or after uh, you take photos, just put the camera away and enjoy you know, being where you're at. Uh, sometimes you can kind of get caught up and forget that you're actually there in the moment as well. And I'll never be able to take a photo of what it smelled like or what it kind of felt like to be there. A little road down on the right hand side going into uh, the 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 jungle there. Um, these are two of my, um, Lorraine is actually an Adam State graduate um, from a few years ago. And then her, uh, her niece, Araya. Uh, and then this was the, one of the many waterfalls we saw, probably the most majestic one. Um, and so getting them framed, I basically walked ahead of them and said, hey guys. And they said, what? And they said, took that photo. And then we continued on our way. Uh, Close-ups of flowers, lots of interesting flowers. Unlike animals, the plants don't run away. So if you're interested, um, you can get a lot of great images of, um, of things. Just, just, you know, one of the magical things about photography is being able to see the world differently than your eye would. So if all you do is, is kind of walk around and take photographs like this, you're just going to get a very kind of pedestrian view of the world. You have to be willing to kind of get on your knees a lot. You have to be willing to look up and look down, get close-ups of things, look at different angles. In every situation you go to, try to break it down into many pictures. Don't just try and use your camera like a vacuum where you just suck everything up once and you say, great, I took a panorama, let's move on. Try to really, you know, try to work for it. And it takes time. And I can't tell you how often when I'm with a group, I'm always the one running, you know, to catch up with everyone because I took five minutes to do that. And then I have to, you know, catch up to everyone. But it's the only way to do it because you got to take the time to get good images. So that's the, uh, that's the, uh, it's probably a larva for a spider actually. Um, so just interesting jungle, especially if you're from a place like Southwest United States, you just don't see this kind of environment before. So it's really exciting to be in a, in a, in a place that you've never been before. And so what other people might find, you know, like if you live there, not that interesting, but it's like, wow, you know, all these epiphytes, all these plants that are growing, growing on plants. That's so fascinating, right? Just to see, you know, the way the jungle almost swallows itself up 
with all that dense vegetation. So a similar example, I was just waiting for them to do just the right thing where I could get a smile and take a photo. Um, that's Alex, one of our guides. Uh, our guides, by the way, have amazing eyes. So if you do this kind of work, definitely hire someone who knows the area well, because they were able to spot things that just you would have never seen in 100 years that they could just they could point out for you. And so he has one of these uh, scopes. It's basically high-powered binocular type of device that allows you to really see things close up. So this is that woolly monkey that I showed you earlier. Um, and uh, Dr. Armstrong told us a story about how monkeys being so intelligent, their level of uh, curiosity or fear is based largely on how much poaching there is or how much bush meat uh, hunting is done in that area. So if the monkeys have little or no pressure on their population, they will come out, they're interested in you, they want to see what you're doing. Um, but as, uh, as they have more and more neg negative experiences with humans, um, they will flee and you'll never even see them. They'll be off up in the trees before. So to be able to see wildlife like this up close is really a sign that they don't have a natural fear of you. I will tell you that the best area I've ever been to to photograph wildlife is the Galapagos Islands. Because in areas where there's no natural predators, you can literally walk up to these animals. They have almost no fear. Um, and frankly, that's how animals like the dodo bird went extinct. Because if you're not afraid of anything, people just walk up and whack them with a rock and and then they have dinner. So yeah. Uh, and then this is that Mot Mot photo I showed you earlier. Uh, so this is uh, one of the, um, the rivers. This is probably the Madre de Dios that we were on. Um, just as kind of this nice clearing uh, that you can see. Um, so sometimes when you're in the dense jungle, you don't even get a really great landscape. We live in a place here where you can see for 50 miles in any direction. But in those environments, man, you're just, you're really tight in the jungle. So being able to get up above it and seeing where you're at is pretty cool. One of the villages we stopped at, a uh, little girl has a minion's backpack on. So um, that was kind of funny to see. Friend the duck. And then this is a wide shot of the same. So the duck is now hiding his head in there. Um, this is, it seemed like it was always laundry day, so people always had their laundry out to dry. I always questioned if it gets dry by hanging it out there. Another example of a photo that really um, benefited from shooting in RAW, because you would have lost a lot of the detail of the interior. Um, when you're trying to shoot inside out the windows, you want to get the outside to expose, but you want to be able to show some of what's inside as well. So I wanted to be able to do that. Um, yeah, just a really nice image. I just liked um, the ripple in the water. This is one of kind of the, the overflow areas. You have to remember that in these jungle environments, the river is not the static thing. I mean, the river swells to three times its normal size during the wet season, and then it shrinks back again. So the logistics of you know building a bridge, you basically have to assume that the river is going to be as wide as it ever could. And then you go in the winter, and you're like, why did they build the bridge that wide? There's just like a tiny stream in the middle. Well, that's why. Again, another example of a, a picture in a picture. Um, sometimes, frankly, you're in an area where there's not a lot of visual interest, and you have to figure out how to make it interesting. And so sometimes that involves placing more objects in the foreground, or you know, finding ways to make the, the, the line of sight or the, the framing more interesting to the eye. All those little mushrooms were walking through the jungle. And there they were. Now, you probably can't see it here, but I cranked the gain up on this camera quite a bit to be able to get this image. Um, and by that, I mean, in the jungle, it's so dark, right? Because all those trees are their own, basically, these solar panels. So they absorb all the sunlight. And on the jungle floor in the middle of the day, you're like, is my camera broken? I'm setting the iris all the way open. And I'm setting the ISO as high as it can go just to get these images. You forget just how much variance there is in daylight, even outdoors, uh, in this kind of an environment. One of the many, many trees in the jungle that seems to go up forever. Um, Butterfly that landed. Uh, that's the photo I mentioned earlier of our guides. We're now on the Oxbow Lake. Um, and they're looking for different animals that are coming out in the evening along the edge of the tree line. Uh, that's William, and then that's Alex. 
Uh, this is sunset, one of many images. I talked about kind of timing the colors for your sunset before. Yeah, many of the ducks that are swimming along. Uh, and then, you know, that special time of day, if you can capture it to get really great, um, really great sunsets. And so you hope for just the right amount of clouds so that they get, you know, they light up uh, with the evening um, sunlight. And then, of course, when you're on a body of water, you think about your framing so that you're getting this mirror image, so that you have this really nice symmetry between the top and bottom. So if you look at my horizon, it's now right down the middle because I want to be able to show, you know, both the, the, the skyline and its reflection. Uh, that's, you know, another morning. Um, Sunrises kind of goes without saying, but for photography, you need to be willing to get up early and also stay out late. And then you kind of take a nap in the middle of the day because that's usually when there's the least activity with animals. The lighting is flat because the sun is overhead. So you get most of your best images early in the morning or in the evening. So this is a, a scarlet macaw, actually several that are um, up in the trees there. And this was taken through that scope that I showed you earlier. I put my camera lens to it, messed with the focus quite a bit, and then I also got a three-toed sloth up sleeping in a tree the same way. They're curious, they're always, it's like they're always smiling. They just kind of have that look to them. Uh, this is the sunrise, the morning we're leaving the jungle. Similar thing, thinking about do you want a vertical frame to kind of emphasize the tree line or do you want a horizontal frame to really kind of showcase the expansiveness of the water and then the, the clouds and the sun there. So we're on our boat and I'm like shooting photos out the boat as we go. And then later in the day we uh, tie off and these are some of the boats that are uh, similar to the ones that we were on. Um, yeah, sometimes if you can, you want to try and lead your viewer's eye so you can kind of see the way this river flows down to tell the story. Um, and then this is that highland area I was talking about before with all the alpacas. Um, it was pretty darn cold up there, pretty, pretty high up, but it was just really cool to be able to see, um, to see that environment. So Alex took this photo for me. Um, you know, really not a lot grows up there because it's so high up. Uh, so it's kind of way above what we would call the timber line. But I was just really fascinated because you have all these, these broken up um, pieces of, of sediment, these rock structures. Um, you can see the snow in the background and yet there's also still moss that's clinging to life there on the side of the mountain. So um, even in these kind of more barren landscapes, it's almost more interesting. Um, and so then there's um, one of the, uh, the herders and their dog coming back down the mountain. And then that's the evening sunset there. Again, just kind of a number of interesting textures going on. Sometimes clouds themselves are interesting enough to photograph. I love the way clouds can sometimes drop shadows onto the landscape. So if you have a hillside that might otherwise be kind of a flat, unremarkable subject, but then you get the cloud cover that's kind of dappling it, the sand dunes, you can go there and see that oftentimes. It's just a really cool effect. Um, there's a portrait, we're back in Cusco for our last few days. We caught a parade, and so all these different elementary school kids were out, um, you know, in their kind of different traditional clothing as they were walking down the street. So you got some photos of what they were wearing. And then we also took some time to look at some of the historical sites and churches um, around Cusco. So any questions? Thank you so much. So you said, um, something you said earlier on, which caught my attention was, you want to see what each image will bring to the group. Mm -hmm. And you created a calendar. Mm -hmm. How did you choose the 12 yeah. and what they each brought to the group? I brought a few copies because I thought that might come up. Um, so among the things that I decided to do with these images um, was create a 12-month calendar of some of my favorite landscapes. And so you can see basically most of the images that I took um, as part of the series are here. Um, and so when you only get 12 choices, right, one for each month, you think about 
you know, what, what does each image bring to the set? Because I wanted to take uh, people to a, a different environment every time. So I wanted some that were um, more urban. I wanted some that were more, um, more kind of in the, the natural landscape, in the jungle area. So, you know, if I could, I wanted to, to showcase different times of day so that they're not all at the same time of day. I wanted to showcase different things I like doing with photography. Um, and so I wanted to be able to showcase that. Um, you know, the 12 images I pick might be different than 12 that someone else would choose because what you find interesting or important might vary. But I did want to kind of showcase, you know, what what I thought was remarkable along the trip. And there may be a little bit of personal prejudice there because maybe I just had a great experience where I was at and I have an emotional association with it that I wanted to share with people. Um, but that was one of the factors was just, you know, what was it like being there and does that translate, you know, into an image. I have a few of these available for sale. I also have them online if you're interested in buying one. 2017 calendars. Um, it, it's actually just one of the ways that I've thought about trying to share the images that I've captured in a way because I, I'm a sucker for calendars. I get several every year. I keep around my house. So they're just good ways, no matter what you're doing in your day, to get transported somewhere else. And being able to make your own calendar is a very expensive hobby, but it is one way to, um, to have a reminder all year long of some of the places that you've been. Other questions? Any information on the camera that you yeah, um, so the camera that I use is a Sony RX10. It's actually not that fancy. Um, and I got it primarily to shoot as a B camera for video production. So if I wanted a more light traveling camera to throw in my backpack, um, that's what I got it for. But it is a DSLR, so it shoots great still images. Um, it is a fixed length lens, so you do have to think about when you start getting into photography, um, I saw a funny Facebook image a while ago that said, um, introduce your kids to photography and they'll never have money to buy drugs. Because <laughs> it's true. Um, I don't know a photographer that if you gave them a gift certificate, they wouldn't know what to spend it on because there's always more lenses and adapters and different kind of hardware. Um, but when you get into the field, you only have so much space, right? And, and ounces make pounds. So you really want to be careful about what you decide to bring with you. So um, I think most photographers will tell you that they want a decent wide to medium uh, lens and then they want like a really good telephoto lens. Um, so most lenses that you purchase are zoom lenses, meaning that they have a varying um, degree that you can use for your lens length. But kind of the best professional lenses are called prime lenses, and they don't zoom at all. They're just a single fixed focal length, uh, and they're optimized for that and that only uh, lens length. So you might get you know, a 25 or a 35 millimeter lens that's kind of a wider lens. You might also get like you know, a 50 to 75 millimeter is a good medium lens, and then something between two and 300 is a good um, telephoto lens length. Unless you're doing really, you know, see the, those really long ones, those are six, 800 millimeter uh, lens lengths. So, um, but yeah, I, I have a pretty basic camera, and I think honestly, um, my experience has been, what I will do is I'll get a piece of gear, and I'll really try and push it to the limits, and once I reach those limits, then I start looking for another camera. But if you have a camera that you don't know what half the buttons do, and you haven't tried out all the features yet, um, do that before you even consider getting a new camera. Um, I'd make a terrible camera salesman, I think, because a lot of times people come to me and say, um, you know, I'm thinking about getting a new camera. I'm like, well, what do you already have? What do you want to do? And you know, about half the time, people already have a camera sufficient for what they want to do. They just haven't used it yet. Um, so no matter what camera you have, just really try and push it to the limit and experiment with it and see what you can do. And so for me, um, shooting this series in RAW and spending a lot of time in Lightroom was my challenge to not just take the images, but really then spend several weeks off and on working on them. Um, so that they're the best that they can be, which is, I think, the part that separates an amateur from a more professional photographer is really utilizing the most information you can with your images rather than just uploading them all to Flickr and saying, great, I'm done. Anything else?
Yeah. That image of the two guys uh, with the water and the guy has his hand out almost feels like a painting. Uh, is there something in particular that you did to look at that effect? Hmm. I want to know what image you're referring to. It's William and Alex, I think. It's oh, okay, great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, I saw it. I'll pull it up for you. So, um, uh, the answer is no. Um, but, so essentially, Jeff, what you're asking is about the, tell me a little bit about what you're seeing here. That's, I think some of it is the shininess in his face, his fingernails, the contrast between his clothing and the, and the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a, a sweaty afternoon. I didn't tell them what to wear that day, but it was hot, and so you kind of you see the little of the perspiration on his face. Um, you do also see kind of an exaggerated uh, distance um, because this is a wider lens. Wide lenses tend to exaggerate proportions, and when you start zooming in, it tends to flatten out those proportions. So here you're seeing um, Alex is like tiny compared to William, they're about the same size as I recall, but uh, so that's the, the kind of effect of the perspective. Um, but no, you know, again, I probably took 10 or 12 images similar to this one, but I probably just responded to a lot of the things you just mentioned. Um, the, the light that time of day, uh, the framing, um, just the, the way the clouds are, are, you know, just those little fluffy clouds up in the sky back there, the reflection on the water. Um, so a number of things were just kind of working well. And I would say that uh, photography is, sometimes it feels a little bit like playing the lottery, because there's just an element of luck, but you don't win if you don't play. So the more photos you take, the more likely you are to really strike something great. You know, and it, it may not be your first image, it may not be your tenth image, um, but if you take enough images without fail, you're going to come back with something that's really interesting, and then your imperative will be to, um, to capitalize on that, to pick up on what your camera caught, and say, oh, I really liked what that was doing. I may not have even noticed. Certainly, with all the things going on at the time, like not trying to fall off the boat, I wasn't thinking through all the things that I'm telling you now, but now in retrospect, yeah, yeah, you're right, Jeff, it does do all those things that you talked about. <laughs> also, you just, I don't know, there's something about the stance, you know, the, the frozenness of that stance, uh, it just strikes me like a painting. Mm -hmm. So what William is doing is he's, he's mid-explanation about whatever he's telling us to look for that we just saw. Um, so he's, he's got our attention, and Alex is looking for the next thing that we're supposed to be seeing. So when we have two guides, they would tend to switch off between one doing the narration and one doing the spotting. And I wanted an image that kind of captured that. So um, if you earn people's trust, if you get them to kind of ignore you long enough to be themselves, you tend to get images that aren't so staged, but tend to really kind of capture a moment in time. And you know, they're very intense when they're out there. It's, a, it's remarkable. Though they do this basically you know, during the entire uh, dry season, uh, they were more excited than we were half the time when we would see something. Uh, you know, we, we'd be out there and, and William would say, oh, wow. Right? And then he would tell us about this, this crazy bird that's like way up in the tree, and then we're spending two minutes with our binoculars to find it. But yeah. Well, very good. So no matter how near or far you travel, um, do think about taking images that you can use to share what that experience was like and getting other people to kind of see the world in a new way through photography. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you.